Banks and funds are overlooked players in market-based solutions to climate change mitigation. Yet they are also responsible for deciding which kind of business economy receives funding. In this video, Rodrigo Zaydan, Associate Professor of Business and Finance at New York University, Shanghai, discusses sustainable lending and investing in more detail with an in-depth look at lending practices by commercial banks, new regulatory standards, and the decision-making processes currently used in lending and investing. Hi everybody, let's talk about bank behavior and bank lending and the process by which banks approve loans to mostly small and medium-sized companies, because that's why we're interested in here. We are interested in, in medium, small and medium-sized companies because those are the companies that first, they comprise most of the economic environment in the world, they provide most of the employment in the world, and they are the ones that do not publish no financial data, they are the ones that might end up as a source of pollution because if, for instance, a large company is well regulated by the state, they might actually outsource the most polluting activities to a privately owned company. Now, to discuss this, we need to understand a little bit about how banks behave, right? The financial system is a regulated system, right? There is no financial system that is unregulated. And the reason, there are many reasons for that. Uh, the main reason for that is called systemic risk, is the fact that banks don't act like regular companies. For a regular company, let's say, um, a 7-Eleven or a McDonald's. If McDonald's fail, Burger King is not going to fail, right? In fact, Burger King might actually benefit by taking McDonald's consumers. Commercial banks don't work that way. Because of fractional reserves, mostly, not only, it's more complicated than that. There is also counterparty risk and other sources of interconnectedness between financial institutions. But, and we have learned this very painfully in 2008, we have, we have, we have known that for a long time, but regulators kind of forgot the lessons from history. Um, but we learned in 2008 that when a large bank fails, it may bring the whole financial system down, right? You shouldn't forget the day, September 15, 2008. That was the day, that was the day that Lehman Brothers announced that was going, it was announced it was filing for bankruptcy and the Federal Reserve announced that it was not bailing out Lehman Brothers, which seems very sensible, right? But, it's triggered the collapse of the world's financial system. It triggered the deepest part of the great financial crisis. In other words, financial systems are much more complicated than most other parts of the economic infrastructure. Now, Regulations since the great financial crisis have changed. And today, these regulations come under the umbrella of the Basel Accords, right? Why Basel, a city in Switzerland? That's where the Bank of International Settlements is headquartered and the, the BIS is the place where central banks congregate. Again, I, I'm simplifying a lot, right? But the idea is that the Basel, the Basel rules are the rules 
that most countries use to regulate their own financial systems. That means that commercial banks mostly, but also other financial institutions, must follow these rules. It includes rules about how much liquidity they must hold, how much assets they must hold for each loan that they want to make, the rules about contingencies, provisions, so on and so forth. For a bank, nothing is more pressure precious than its own capital, right? Because its own capital, shareholder equity, it is the capital that must be put aside in the case of leverage, right? So the idea is that banks, a bank might have, let me give a very simple example. A bank might have $1 billion in uh, shareholder equity, and it must have loans of $10 billion, right? So that will be a leverage ratio of 10. So it must, it might also have liabilities of $10 billion or $9 billion or $10 billion or whatever um, that uh, would owe to its depositors, right? So if a bank goes bankrupt, the only amount that is tangible to meet its obligations, other than assets that might lose its value, it's, it's shareholder equity. Again, I'm making a lot of simplifications. It doesn't work like that. It's much more complicated than that. But the idea is that banks are well-regulated institutions. So banks, they have very hard set criteria for lending money. They must not only answer to regulators, but they must also, given all these constraints, they wanna make money, right? So at the end of the day, how does it work? Now I am in China, right? What is interesting is that in, in many ways, China is more, technologically sophisticated than many places in the world. So because, partly because the financial system in China, the commercial banks in China are state-owned and relatively inefficient, um, you have a huge non-banking system that works in terms of lending money, that even works for, um, Consumers, final consumers. So I'm gonna show you something, right? Um, I am, this is an app. Let me see, okay. See this? this is an app called Alipay, right? Which is the main way that people use for payments in China. What is interesting about Alipay, let me see if I can find here is that Alipay gives me a true a subsidiary in almost real time, my credit score, right? It generates a credit score through machine learning, uh, through an automatic system that creates its, its score based on the pattern of consumption, how many loans I have taken with the company, how much money I spent through that, um, and much more information about me. I'm a foreigner. I actually had to change my cell phone. So actually my score is quite low, which is fine. I'm not planning on taking a mortgage here in China, and I'm not planning on taking much long, so I don't mind having a low score system, right? But I can show you. I see, right? You can see it here, you have a number. Right? That number, which is again not very high. Unfortunately, I had a much higher number. Even if I don't want to use it, I had a much higher number. But because I lost 
my my SIM card and I'm exchange numbers, and I'm not a Chinese uh, national. Uh, Alipay doesn't deal with foreigners in in this MUFIS way. This is a credit rating, right? So if I want to get a loan from Jima through Alipay, I can get a loan, an automatic loan, to a certain amount, to a certain interest rate, given this number that I just showed you. That's what banks do to lend money to all sorts of companies. So when a small or medium-sized company knocks on the door of an account manager in a bank anywhere in the world, that account manager will order that a credit rating is created for that company. That will define the company's credit limits. It will define the interest rate that the company is going to pay. Is going to, and of course, as the company evolves in its relationship with the bank, the credit rating can go up or it can go down. This is how banks work all the time, everywhere in the world. I just showed you how banks do that for you much less efficiently than in the case of Alipay because Alipay observes a lot of my transactions, right? Maybe not as efficient because again, I'm a foreigner in China. That is a myth that credit ratings are created through quantitative information only, right? That account managers will get a financial statement from a company, put in a magic box, and the magic box will spit out a number. That's not how it works. Credit ratings are a mix of quantitative and qualitative information. However, today, the main standard in the world is that credit ratings mostly or almost solely rely on trying to answer a single question. What is the likelihood that the company will repay its loans based on its credit capacity, based on how much money the business will generate. That is a heavy tilt towards financial metrics, not necessarily quantitative only, quantitative measures as well, but mostly financial metrics. That's where we come in with the SSCSS. We created something that is going to allow banks to generate credit ratings, to incorporate seamlessly into their credit ratings system a rating that involves no financial metrics. The system that I'm going to present to you later is a system that was originally developed for a multinational bank that is one of the largest banks in the world. I didn't sign an NDA, so I, I can say the name of the bank. I just prefer not to. After all, uh, um, the bank didn't use the system partly because of the fact that Brazil entered the steepest recession in, in its history. So the bank pretty much abandoned many efforts, including this one. But banks create ratings for all their companies. And the ratings will be similar to the ones that you find on 
S&P and Moody's. Triple A, double A plus, A, B, 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 B minus, C, D. Banks will define internally which companies are investment grade, which ones are not. And again, we must create products that make banks incorporate non-financial criteria into their lending decision process. Why? Because banks will make more money. If there are two companies that are equally, they have the same financial, product, financial profile, but one company has climate risk and another company has climate opportunity, the bank should prefer to lend money to the second company. It should reduce loans to the first and increase loans to the second. It makes business sense and it makes social sense. And again, this will happen. It will happen either through regulatory drive, which may be very inefficient, or it may happen by financial agents incorporating a new way of um, rating the companies in their portfolios. Not listed companies. There are public ratings for listed companies. That's not what we want here. And the next, the last step of my lecture to you is discussing how we create, how a rating is created inside the SONA Sustainability Credit Score System, the SSDSS. We're gonna see that this may revolutionize financial systems by allowing any investor, any interest party in any company in the world to create a rating that is not purely a credit rating, but is a non-financial rating. That is also not an ESG rating. And the reason that is not a ESG rating is because ESG only looks at risks and the SSCSS also looks at opportunities. After all, if you tell an account manager that you're gonna create a rating that is only gonna lower the credit limits of the companies in their portfolio, that rating will not be used. A rating that only lowers, that only reduces loans is not that useful for the financial industry. But the details of the SSCSS we discuss next. Okay. Pleasure. See you in a bit.